Hi there, Will here. And today I'd like to talk to you about my favorite 35mm camera, the Contax G2. Although there is a caveat to that uh, favorite statement, which I'll get to later. I'll start this off the same way I did my Mamiya RB67 and Mamiya 7 reviews, which is to say that I've owned this camera for four years, and in those four years it has been repaired zero times. Which is very cool. It's nice to own an analog camera that hasn't needed any sort of repair. With regards to non-repair related issues that I've had with the camera, the very well-known autofocus issue uh, was a problem initially, just because it's very hard to discern whether or not this camera is in focus unless you're keeping a very close eye on the autofocus uh, function. So the best way to be certain that you always nail focus every time is just to get accustomed to the sound the motor makes when it's focusing. So if it focuses on nothing in particular, it'll make a sound like that. And if it's focusing on something specific, it'll sound like that. It's uh, quite subtle, but eventually one learns to listen out for it. And if you're focusing on anything that isn't at infinity, hearing that sound is a very bad sign. So if you ever hear the zzz and not the zzz, <laughs> then you know that uh, you need to refocus with the G2. And once you've sorted that out, you're completely fine. The only true issues I've ever had with the camera were as a direct result of the flash units, the TLA200, because for some reason the first one I had, which I picked up in miserable condition for £20, eventually ended up registering on the camera, so the camera knew that it was there, but it didn't sync and flash every time, so often it would take a very long exposure instead of uh, firing the flash, which was very frustrating and led to a lot of very weird pictures. But. Besides those minor flash-related and the well-documented autofocus issue, which you can get a hold of eventually, this is far and above my favorite 35mm camera, for a variety of reasons. I'll start with the ergonomics. The first time I held one of these was at a film and beer meet that Nico from Nico's Photography Show organized in London, and George from Negative Feedback was there, and he had his Contax G2 with him, and I held that and it blew my mind. Just the way these cameras feel in hand, for me specifically, it feels like it was made for my hands. Like, holding it is a transcendent experience. It's just there's no other camera I've ever handled that felt like this camera does in hand. And in using it, like, all the settings are in the right place. Like, you don't need to fiddle about with stuff. You can adjust the aperture with one hand if you need to. It's all exactly where it needs to be. And the way it feels, makes it worth owning alone, really, for me. Like, even if this thing stopped working, I'd still pick it up every now and again just to feel this glorious camera's body. The other thing I noticed holding this camera for the first time is that the viewfinder is absolutely tiny, especially compared to the Nikon F3, which I'd been using up until that point. Looking through one of these things was just uh, a bit funny because it's really, really small. Like, if you had to try and manual focus through that hole there, it would be a problem. It's big enough for you to be able to compose a frame and it uh, takes into account parallax automatically which is cool but uh, in terms of raw size it's not very big and uh, on the manual focus note it uh, isn't actually really possible to manual focus this lens you can manually focus it through the body by guessing the distance of your subject from you and setting it with this little scroll wheel here but uh, in terms of true manual focus that is not something you will ever have on this camera and besides the ergonomics the lenses on the Contax G series are amazing. This 45mm Zeiss Planar T lens has something that I've seen described online as micro contrast going for it. And the direct result of it that I've noticed is that it's a lot punchier than a lot of the other lenses I've used, especially when it comes to shadows. And it renders water specifically in a way that no other lens I've used can render water. The big downside to it though, that I mentioned earlier, is the fact that at any given moment, at any point in time, the day you buy it, two days after you buy it, a week after you buy it, four months after you buy it, 10 years after you buy it, it could brick for no reason. They are very well known to just brick these cameras. And when they do brick, it's probably an electronic issue. And if it's an electronic issue, I wouldn't say it's unrepairable, but it's gonna cost a lot to repair and you're better off buying a new body. But you get to keep the old body. And as I said, the ergonomics on these things are worth owning even if it is brick, for me at least. And if you think about it, and that is the way I think about this camera, as a workhorse and a camera to maybe eke a living out, it works really well because it's 35 millimeter, which is a lot more ergonomic than medium format. And the results that you can get out of it, if it's scanned decently, 
or hand printed, which is even better for 35 millimeter, are sublime. This lens, there is no other lens on a 35 millimeter camera that I enjoy as much as this one. There are probably sharper lenses and lenses that are more technically perfect. I don't know, I don't get too deep into lenses, but the way that this lens specifically renders a frame, color or black and white, is amazing. And I know I'm gushing over this camera more than I have in the past, but really, the only downside I've ever found with this thing is the fact that I'm constantly aware of uh, its demise being very imminent because of uh, it being electronic. Besides that, everything about it is just a joy to use. The autofocus issue, as I said, is an issue, but you can also get over it very quickly once you've uh, come to terms with the sound of the camera. There are also a couple of secret settings in this camera. Well, somewhat secret. I think they used to come printed on the back, but obviously most of the examples that aren't mint floating around these days don't have it anymore. But it's uh, settings that control the way the camera brackets and it, whether the film rewinds with the leader out or the leader in, if that's something you wanted to change. And you change that by holding in the ISO and focus lock buttons for a few seconds. And then uh, digits will start flashing, one or zero, and uh, one being the mode where the leader is out and it brackets I don't know, I'll just chuck up the diagram here, but you can switch that around if you need to. I like mine on one with the leader out just because some of the other settings that are associated with that mode are more in line with the way I like to shoot. And uh, with regards to adjusting the ISO, it's just this button on the side that you hold in and then you adjust it with the little scroll wheel here. In terms of the way I use this camera, I very, very seldomly shoot it in manual mode. I find the metering to be excellent if you keep an eye out on what you're metering for because it's center weighted and the overall user experience of this camera is much better if you just let it uh, be automatic. I would definitely enjoy having this lens as a manual focus lens because the autofocus, I don't know, I've never really enjoyed autofocus on cameras, but the way this thing is designed to be used is chucked into auto mode and you just blast away with the auto exposure setting. And uh, it is very easy to blast through rolls on this thing. I think it gets like eight frames per second if you chuck it in uh, high speed mode, which is cool. And as a slight nitpick, not a big one, but I think one of the biggest features of this camera in terms of focus itself is meant to be that it's infrared focusing, so it doesn't need to be super bright for it to be able to focus. But I have found that to be somewhat intermittent because uh, in low light situations, it has struggled on occasion. It is definitely better than anything else from uh, its era and even some more modern cameras, but uh, it's not foolproof, that infrared autofocus thing. So you have to, on occasion, shine a torch on someone's face if you're taking pictures at night, but I'm just nitpicking. <laughs> Overall, this camera is amazing and I love it and uh, I hope it gives me many more years of use and if it doesn't, I'll probably try and figure out a way to pick up uh, a working body if I get into 35mm stuff again. I'm kind of focusing on uh, 120 these days, but I love it and I'm sure you would too. And uh, in terms of justifying the prices that they go for these days, I think it is quite easy to do if you plan to use it uh, to try and maybe make a living or just make a serious amount of work because if you think about it, it still costs less at the price it is now than uh, a decent full frame DSLR and uh, no full frame DSLR that I'm aware of has the user experience of this thing, which I just adore. Absolutely adore. So unlike the Mimir 7, I would fully recommend that anyone who can save up the money to buy one and is willing to risk it bricking on them go forth and do so because it's an amazing camera. This has been the most pain-free camera that I've owned for this amount of time, besides the Nikon F3. And uh, it's not fair to compare anything to the Nikon F3 because that camera is amazing as well. If you want the camera to look even better though, the 16mm lens that I tried out in this video makes this camera look better than any other camera in my mind. I don't know. And this is all very specific. You probably have a different favorite camera, but to me, this one is the one. And with that 16mm lens, it's even more the one because its form factor is super nice and flush to the body. And it just looks amazing. Like if I had a limitless budget and just wanted to own a camera that looked super cool to walk around with, I would pick up a Contax G2 and that 16mm lens because boy oh boy does that look nice.